Hi, David. Hi, Simon. Uh, so this is a brief introduction for students or potential students to our course foundations and applications of humanities analytics. And I think the opening question uh, might be, why is a philosopher of science, you're a philosopher of science, why is a yeah. philosopher of science leading this course? That, that's, a, that's a great question, Simon. And I think it really comes down to, you know, by taking an epistemological approach, or so you might call it an epistemology of first approach, to humanities analytics, sometimes called digital humanities or cultural analytics. What we're doing is something very different from other introductions to uh, this field that might be offered to a PhD student or a scholar in the humanities, which is sort of our core audience. And what we're doing there is rather than sort of saying, here are some tools go ahead and use them to do quantitative work in the digital humanities, we're starting with the question sort of what is the epistemology of this new science, right? What mm -hmm. is the process by which this new way of thinking about human cultural output allows us to form justified beliefs and possibly <laughs> even knowledge if you think there's such a thing as knowledge. I'm, I'm personally a little skeptical. So that's really where I think uh, a, a, a philosophy of science and a philosophical approach more broadly to humanities analytics really has some value. So that 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 would be my answer to that question. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's, this is interesting, David. I mean, the, the the idea of beginning first with you know, how are we going to go about knowing what's the nature of the subject itself? Um, you know, that's that's something I think that's been difficult for those of us coming from the technical side, the scientific side coming in, uh, because you know the 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 criteria for what it means to get something right is very different. Um, the, the, the kinds of things we're interested in knowing are very different in the sciences versus the humanities. And, you know, part of this work to me has always been, uh, how, are we, how are we getting things right for both sides of the aisle, as it were? Yes, I, th I think that's right. I think that's right. And I think that um, what's important to note is this is a very new field of inquiry. So in that case, it's to be, to be putting together this kind of course and to be you know, trying to address this, not by sort of, here's how to plug in your corpus into an LDA topic model, but rather to start a little earlier, we, we will get to things like that, but to start a little earlier by saying, you know, here is, here is this new science, what are its foundations? What are its goals? What are its interests? Um, I think is, is a really cool way to start. And I say new science is obviously also a new approach to the humanities. So what you say about hitting both sides of that aisle is exactly right. And again, our focus is really on an audience of humanities scholars and people whose interest is first and foremost in some area of cultural, uh, cultural output by human beings. And then, you know, sort of taking it from there uh, to try and see how we can use some quantitative and computational tools uh, to to make make new progress uh, in, in these areas and gain new insights. Yeah. I mean, one of the one of the things that's always struck me is in the end, I've I've never done a project in cultural analytics that doesn't involve a collaboration uh, between people whose PhDs were in technical right. and fields and people who uh, write monographs for a living. Right. So right. I think there's one of the things that um, I remember, you know, the first time I, I pitched this to an audience of historians and work we had done for an audience yeah. of historians, um, you know, I had uh, someone in the back said, how many books of history do we have to throw out because of what you've just done? And, you know, what he was really after, of course, was what kind of knowledge is this, yeah. right? W like, what have you done? How does this bear on a, uh, a practice that is, you know, much, much older, in fact, than uh, any of the empirical sciences. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think it, it highlights what I see is a really important goal of this course, perhaps maybe the goal of this course for students, which is we want to use this course to train uh, humanities scholars to get to a point where they can be collaborators within digital humanities projects, right? So I think you're exactly right that sort of humanities analytics, digital humanities project works best when you have a team that includes a humanist and someone perhaps from a more sort of computational or quantitative background, at least those two, and then often more, you know, three or four authors is really a really nice number often. And that's really <laughs> what we're trying to do here is trying to bring people who maybe come from more traditional humanities background to that place 
where they can approach someone who maybe works in a cognitive science department or a computer science department and say, I've got a really cool question that I think can be answered by computational analytics techniques. Let's work together, but let's not have it totally be siloed off where I'm just doing the humanism and you're just doing the computation, but let's actually work together and find like a nice meaty part of that Venn diagram that, over, that, in, that intersects um, so that we can really bring something new to the table rather than just two people doing two things in their own space and then mashing that together into a paper. Well, this, I mean, this is one thing that comes up now is um, this is now something you can actually do, I think, as scholars. There was, uh, we've always had, um, you know, people in the humanities doing from, you know, place to place doing quantitative analyses. I was just reading Alistair McKinnon, the philosopher in the 60s, did a style of, uh, stylometric study of Kierkegaard pseudonyms, right? Oh, wow. Uh, which is quite fun. So yeah. I'm not quite sure what to make of it. Uh, he, he takes the ratio of logarithms, which I'm unhappy about. Uh, but uh, one of the things now, it seems like these, these uh, kind of team efforts are increasingly uh, part of the culture in the humanities. Uh, we have, and uh, coming up in, as part of this course, we have guest lecturers, uh, all of whom are going to be talking about how this work gets into the scholarship in the humanities. And so another question is, how can we, uh, how can we do this work and have it not be like a one-off, Kind of fun thing that you did on the side, but how can this actually help someone build a scholarly profile, uh, build a body of work that will last a long time? That's that's a really good point, and I think I'm glad that you mentioned the guest lecturers in this course because if someone's watching this introductory video and thinking I'm just going to have to listen to these two for you know <laughs> ten to okay. fourteen weeks or however many years, no, that's not the case. I mean, we've got a great lineup of guest lecturers, and just three to highlight now are Lauren Klein, Richard Jean So, and Julia Lefkowitz. Uh, each of which has kind of uh, been given the brief to kind of present something that's meant to be a little bit inspiring, right? We're going to be talking a lot about foundations, a little bit of applications as well, kind of giving students the nuts and bolts of what we see as uh, good humanities analytics scholarships. But that's different from seeing a finished project. And while we will present some finished projects, I think it's really great to bring someone else in, you know, just in Julia's case, for instance, here's someone who wrote a PhD thesis quite recently in a sort of digital humanities area and can really sort of walk people through how that project works and how she actually got from a humanities background to actually doing a fully fledged scholarly project in digital humanities. Similarly with Lauren Klein's work, I think we get a really great sense of um, how you know her, her really deep interest in sort of core humanities topics like power and how power has worked throughout history and in American history led to this sort of quantitative project that yields some really interesting uh, insights about who was leading and who was following in the language of abolitionist newspapers. And then finally, in, in Richard Jean So's presentation, I think there's just such innovation in the way that he finds sources to think about um, how storytellers are interacting with COVID-19 in this area of pandemic that we are obviously still in. So I think between those three projects and there, there, you know, there, there are other guest lecturers as well, potentially, but between those three projects, um, it's just a really nice sense of, of what people are gonna get out of this course beyond just the nuts and bolts, sort of seeing how they can sort of see their own research through the same prism that they, these guest lecturers have. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the key things that we're, you know, we've we've been doing here is uh, there's there's plenty of really fun theory one can do about uh, what it would mean to investigate, you know, an aesthetic experience uh, and historical event uh, quantitatively. We're really focused on getting people up and running uh, in their own projects. Our goal here is uh, things that. Uh, people can immediately start applying. Maybe they're not beginning a PhD thesis on something they've learned in lecture or two, right? But uh, getting people to the place where they can start doing this, right? They don't, they don't have to buy our particular epistemology no. in order to get going. No. Um, one thing, so one of the big features of this course uh, that we've been funded to do, which is particularly exciting, is run in parallel with the lectures each week uh, run an online uh, discussion forum where people will be able to exchange ideas, talk about things, ways for which people can not only try to solidify the understandings they have from the lectures, but also hopefully build collaborations, uh, build networks and relationships with other people who are following along. Yeah, as much as is possible within a sort of online course format, we do 
see one of our sort of meta goals for this course, right, is to build the next generation of humanities analytics scholars, right? And a big part of that is creating connections, right? Because for everything we can teach and everything we can lecture about, uh, there's no substitute for the sort of organic connection that happens when two scholars come together and realize that there's a common interest and a common interest in investigating that interest. Um, and that would be the greatest if we can, um, you know, facilitate some of that. I did want to go back to one thing you said about, you know, we don't we don't need you to watch lecture two here and go off and write a PhD thesis. I think one of the nice things about the humanities analytics paradigm is because the sort of unit of a project tends to be a paper rather than necessarily, you know, a full book. It is possible for someone to come away from this course um, have an idea, build it up a little bit more, and develop it in a, in a reasonable amount of time that isn't going to totally sidetrack perhaps their more traditional humanities, you know, humanities scholarship, right? So if, if, you're, if you're listening to this and thinking, well, I have the book that I know I want to write, and it's ultimately a sort of a qualitative project in my field of expertise, uh, that that isn't meant to be not, nothing we're doing here is meant to keep you from doing that it's sort of uh, just augmenting your scholarship right it's not taking anything away from your other scholarship because i think we're both people who love the humanities and don't want to see what we're doing as in any way in sort of competition for sort of resources or research time with sort of uh, more traditional work in the humanities it, it it can and often is it can be and often is excellent and so we don't want to sort of see ourselves in competition there at all. Yeah, no, I mean, there's, I think this is a great, you know, thing to bring up, right? There's different ways this kind of work can get into scholarship. So our guest lecturers, by and large, are talking about, um, uh, you know, cultural analytics projects from start to finish. Uh, in Lauren Klein's case and Richard Jean So's case, uh, these end up being papers, uh, papers in some of the top humanities journals, certainly. Uh, there's lots of venues for people to publish this work, so Journal of Cultural Analytics, for example. Um, but at the same time, I think this course is something that can serve as a way for people to supplement the research they're doing, right? This could be um, some tools that would enter in a single chapter of a larger monograph, a larger dissertation. So there's, um, you know, this can be a supplement to uh, work that one's already doing. Uh, but this can also be a jumping off place to do really, truly original work from start to finish, a piece of work that is uh, where the qualitative and the quantitative are inextricably tied together. That, that's a really great point. That's a really great point. I do want to emphasize, though, because, you know, we're, we're going a lot, um, a lot down this path of sort of thinking about the relevance of our course for its core audience, which is a sort of PhD student in the humanities. That's how we've designed the course. Um, but that isn't to the exclusion of, I think, other people getting a lot out of this course. I mean, we've always said that while we do have this core audience, um, it's also the case that we would love um, for people, whether it's, um, you know, more, more senior scholars or maybe an undergraduate um, who's just very interested or someone who works uh, as a librarian or something like that, uh, to get more into humanities analytics uh, foundations and techniques. Certainly nothing we've said here should be to the exclusion of someone like that getting as much as possible out of this course, right? And maybe it is just, you know, doing more scholarship or maybe it's just having a broader understanding of this world and how it works or on the undergraduate side, maybe thinking differently about the kind of academic trajectory that they'd like to pursue going forward. I think all of that is possible and the course is designed to have that flexibility as well. I think, you know, the assignments are sort of more broad, broadly written enough and broadly pitched enough that anyone with an interest in humanities analytics can get a lot out of this course, I would hope. I mean, so yeah, I mean, our, our mandate from the National Endowment for the Humanities is broad. There's no particular yep. career stage that you need to be at. Uh, there's no particular career stage we expect you to be at. Um, for many people, the unit of work is the journal paper, certainly the sciences. Uh, for many people, it's the monograph. But also for many people, it's the website, um, it's the uh, undergraduate class. Certainly, uh, humanities analytics is something that's showing up in the liberal arts colleges just as much as the research universities. Um, the you know what is our mandate? Our mandate is to enable people to empower people to do uh, great scholarship of any form, 
at the cutting edge of, well, I said, you know, sort of pun to the philosopher of science, whatever is actually going on when we open these books, but also open our laptops at the same time.